Do you like wrestling trivia? Then check out the five-star match game, the Pro Wrestling Quiz Show. I'm Joe Gagne, and every episode, I grill three contestants with five rounds of power-packed wrestling trivia. We have over 30 evergreen episodes in the archives covering WWE, AEW, Japan, Mexico, and much, 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 much more. Play along at home and check it out today. Hey, kids, do you like wrestling? Well, we like wrestling, too. We are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Myself and Chris Novembrino kind of doing a lazy river of wrestling criticism, going through the news and whatever happened in stateside television wrestling. And also, you know what? Sometimes we just like to watch old stuff and talk about that, too. Love for you to give us a listen. If you haven't already, we are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Hey there, Thunder Buddies and Travelers Down Thunder Road. It's us, Days of Thunder, the WWE Thunder Rewatch podcast that you didn't ask for, but we did anyway, coming to you as part of the Voices of Wrestling podcast network and powered by a large man appears.com. I'm your host, your hell Satan on Thunder Road, Dave Ryan, and I am joined as always by my faithful co host, perhaps the new flat pack sovereign of the podcast. <laughs> it's L- Lee Malone. Lee, how are you? I'm not too bad. I'm uh, in flying form. This this week, good. I am as well. Uh, you you're just back from holidays. I I just flown home from Italy, and boy are my arms tired. Yeah, um, and I'll tell you, I've I've been home, and my arms are tired from all the the work I've been doing in the house. Yeah, it sounds like you've just basically built a whole new house. Yeah, uh, well, I, w- I wouldn't go that far. I mean, but uh, yeah, no, doing a lot of rearranging of stuff and all the fun stuff you have to do when you have a toddler that grows and can now reach different things. Yes, yes. You need to, like, every six months, like, raise everything in the house oh, like half a foot. Three months. There's fucking six <laughs> months. Three months. Once yeah. they start walking, that's it. That's it, yeah. Nail everything down or raise everything up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, do you get the... Because, you know, we were talking off air about that you were doing some flat packs this week. Do you get the... Do you get the zen kind of relaxed uh, vibe from doing the big boy Legos? Um, no. Or does it stress you out? I, I, I hate doing them. To, to the point where if it's something really large, like um, yeah. there's a big kind of unit, eight like eight drawer unit behind my shoulder here. Um, yeah. I can't remember if that was in Ikea or, or somewhere else, but uh, to the point if I have like one or two of them to do in a day and like yeah. a chest drawer or something, I will actively send Jen and the kids out for the day to not be bothering me. Yeah. Uh, what I'll do is I'll like, I'll go into my sitting room because there's a good bit of floor space there. Mm-hmm. I'll bring in my flat packs. I'll pop in the headphones and I'll put on if I can find a podcast series that I can just dive into or like a run of podcasts like one that I the most recent set of flat packs I did. I I started listening to like the Attitude Era podcast from the start Mm. again so that I could just kind of just go through a bunch of them without having to touch my phone or anything. Crack a cold beverage and then I'm just in relaxation station, baby. Um, uh, there's something I think it's the part of my brain that really loves Tetris <laughs> it, it is like I love to see a flat pack come together oh um, don't don't get me wrong when it's done I have a great sense of achievement yeah that me and like every other fucking 40 year old man has been able to put together this bookshelf or whatever yeah Um, but yeah no it, it's it's one of those things of I know I have to do it because nobody else is going to do it and, yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just it's uh, that obligation and it, again with the aforementioned toddler and also you know the big dog you've got other things that are drawing your attention away if you haven't sent everybody constantly. away whereas 
Do you know, I've got I've got the animals and and Emma here, but Emma knows to stay out my way when I'm doing a flat pack, just because I not because I get annoyed or anything, but I get easily distracted and stop doing it. Yes. So she will kind of give me my space, and she enjoys her own space as well. So she'll go off mill about for the day with the dog and the cats, and, mm-hmm. and that's fine. Um, yeah. God, such fucking dad chat to start this <laughs> off. Will I, will I do a little bit of uh, travel logging my my trip to Italy? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah um, absolutely. Italy's like my my favorite country in the whole world. Really? Um, that isn't that isn't here. Like I do, I do have a real soft spot for Ireland. I have to say, I'm a real home bird. I don't think. I don't think I've ever really seriously ever considered not living here because I died for all its faults and there are many and we have <laughs> gone on at length about them on this show and off it. We have. Uh, I do quite like it at the same time. Um, but Italy is probably my favorite country in the whole world. Like for the the kind of, you know, pe- people have asked me before, like, why do you like it? And it's, it's, it's triple threat, isn't it? It's like a rich history. So there's always stuff to go look at and to see and to talk about. The food, obviously, and football. Yeah, um, that, that's three three good aspects, all right. We are th- we are two men of a generation that grew up watching a little show called Gazetta Football Italia on Channel Four, where we saw the the, the glory days of Serie A in our lifetime. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a certain degree to which Italian football is almost mythologized. More so than English football, I think, because we get so much exposure to English football. Whereas we had Gazetta for a few years and then it was gone. So, yeah. like, there was there's this kind of mythical quality to it uh, that I've always loved. And the I went just before COVID. I can't remember if we were doing this podcast at the time. Um, but I went to, to Rome and to Venice. I think uh, for we, my we, have, we have been doing it. I think it was your first trip when we were doing the, the podcast. Yeah, it was. It was either the first year or right before. Yeah, because we had been doing it for a year when mm-hmm. COVID happened, weren't we? Yeah, and this was summer twenty nineteen. Um, Jesus, we've been doing this for a long time, buddy. It's never ending. Um, <laughs> never ending. <laughs> but uh, yeah, well, I went to Rome and Venice that time, and it was in the middle of the summer, so there was no football on. So I got loads of history because it's Rome and Venice. Loads of food because it's Italy, but no football. So this time I completed the trifecta. Uh, what's great about um, the food in, in Italy, like when you're going to like non-tourist trappy places to eat, is like every meal you have there is usually in contention for the best meal you've had in years. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, actually, I was, I was talking to my, my dad uh, at the weekend and he was saying it's coming up on a year since himself and my mom went to Venice. And he said he still hasn't recovered because of the amount of pizza, wine, mm. and pasta-based foods that he ate. He just still yeah. feels he's just not over it. There's a thing about it that no country in the world is able to nail. Like, and it feels such a pretentious thing to say, but to like nail pizza and pasta the, the way Italy does it. And you'd expect them to do it better than everybody else, but like... There's this kind of when you have a pizza here in Ireland or even, you know, somewhere else that's not as a pizza like America pizza over there. Usually it's a very heavy dish. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And the same with pasta. Whereas over there, it's like I can eat a, just a just a fucking like criminally large carbonara <laughs> and not be and not feel enormous. Full. Yeah, yeah. And the same with the the crust on the pizza. There's just this kind of like it's definitely substantial the crust, but it's it's light on the stomach. Um, and look, the fuckers all live to be about a hundred years old. So um, they're doing something so right. Yeah, they are doing something right. And then yeah, just in terms of I suppose the closest parallel to to wrestling here is getting to a live sports experience there. So I got to two matches in Syria, which is like again the the boyhood dream had come true. Um. We were not in the country 24 hours when I went to the San Siro for the first time. I had booked two San Siro trips because it's a legendary Italian stadium, if you don't know it, where both teams in Milan play. And there has been talk over the last couple of years that they, they're trying to knock it down and, and, and build a new stadium. So it has been averted. Recently, It was the knock was averted uh, and they're going to keep it for the foreseeable. But I was like, I don't know if that's always going to be the case because they've been going back and forth on it for so many years. So I was like, I could have traveled to a couple of other places to go see matches, but I was just like, no, I'm going to take in two in this mm-hmm. stadium because I may, I may never get to set foot here again. So I went to see uh, Inter versus Sassuolo. 
uh, on the first night, which, inter- which is just Inter like, lost, by the way. Inter lost. They were on a hot start to the season, and I jinxed them. Um, they lost two one. Enjoyable match. Standard was was pretty reasonable. Um, I, I've heard Berardi had a very good game, so you got you Berardi, got to see that. Yeah, 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 and scored an unbelievable goal, mm-hmm. unbelievable assist, unbelievable goal. So that was good. Like, cause I I have no specific team I favor in Syria. I like a bunch of teams. So oh really? What's What's great for me is that I get to go to games and I don't have a dog in the race. So regardless of the result, unless it's nil nil, I'm happy. You know. Um. So there are various times, though, over the years where I favoured one team over another. There was a while in the 90s where I loved Juve when they had, like, Zidane and then latterly, like, Nedved and Del Piero and, Dufon, you know, players like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, there was a while during the glory days of, of Milan. Uh, well, the, the the most recent glory days of Milan, the mid two th- early to mid-2000s when they had, like, Shevchenko and Pirlo and Kaká. Um, Maldini, Nesta, Costa Corta, Rui Costa, we, 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 all we, those we, boys. That damn near unplayable for about three years. Yeah, I was telling Emma that when we were on the San Siro tour, where there was just like there was no team I was more shit scared to death of Manchester United drawing in the Champions League than Milan because I was like, well, that's it, that's the run yeah. over. Um, so yeah, and then there are times as well, like uh, I think of uh, two thousand and nine, two thousand and ten in particular, where I loved. Uh, Inter Milan under Jose Mourinho. For, for a totally different reason. <laughs> yeah. And in the late 90s, I love them as well because they had the original Ronaldo oh, phenomena mm-hmm. for for um, a little while. A cup of coffee. Yeah, no, nobody um, nobody had Ronaldo for any significant amount of time. Yeah. And then kind of like in the recent years, like the Napolis and the Atalantas that play interesting mm-hmm. styles that contrast with other teams in the league. I've, I've got soft spots for. But anyway... Um, yeah, Inter Sassuolo was fun, but then the true classic Serie A experience happened for me at the weekend when I went to see AC Milan versus Lazio. Two of the big, big names in the history of that competition, in the history of that country. Um, and and uh, that was it, like... For any American listeners that we may have, or uh, listeners that aren't football fans, if you aren't aware of Lazio fans and their reputation... <sighs> yeah, so... Lazio, for historical context, was the club of Mussolini. Yes. Um, and much as the club, so that you need to understand in Italian football culture, the club and the fans are two completely separate entities. Yeah, it's very odd in it's that It's very sense. odd. Yes, there are, there are factions of fans called ultras, uh, particularly in Italy. There's lots of them in South America as well, but I think for most football fans, Italy is the country you associate with ultras most. And the the Lazio Ultras have a long and, in their estimation, proud history of fascism. Yeah. Um, that in more recent years, Lazio, the club and the business, have actively tried to distance themselves from. Uh, and, you know, you watch these shows and you read the stories about Lazio fans and things like that. And you think, God, like, you know, um, sweeping generalizations and shit like that. But when you see... The away fans that usually get tickets to games are the hardest of the hardcore. So it, they're overrepresented by the ultras at away games. And I was in kind of right nicely kind of... I almost had the television camera's view of the pitch. Like I was near the halfway line, about halfway up, nicely in the middle. I had the Corvo Sud on my right, which is like the hardcore AC Milan fans. And then up distantly as geographically far in the stadium as you can get them away from each other they have the Lazio fans oh they had them third up high. Tier okay in the corner yes um and uh, the first time i copped sight of the block of them they were all doing fascist salutes <laughs> like uh, every one of them i could lo- i could clock was doing the fascist salute now i will say over the far side of that same stand there was the more kind of rational and for fuck's sake how are we stuck with these guys lazio fans who were just like sitting there trying to enjoy the game just sitting there going mad um, they're at it again yeah and like they are definitely like so inter and sassuolo it was all very cordial during the week mm. and everybody was kind of like applauding when regardless of what like say berardi scored and there was shock and silence but like there was respect for for berardi and for sassuolo uh lazio truly the heels of Syria. like anytime they tried to get any chant going they were fucking booed out of it by 66,000 plus people I don't know 
I know there was 72 at the game. Uh, I don't know how many of them were Lazio fans, but it was very funny. That's just like, we are not having your shit. Thank you. <laughs> um, but that was a fabulous game as well. Um, an easy win for Milan in the end, 2-0. Um, did, did, you, that, uh, did you hear about, I don't know if you've, you've heard uh, the Totally Football Show European edition this week, but no. uh, James Horncastle was talking about, uh, I think it was Salernitana at the weekend. Yeah. Yeah, the, they the played, ultras. Um, they played Inter. They had um, a Pink Floyd tribute. Hmm. Their ultras had like a fiftieth. Apparently, it's the fiftieth anniversary of the Wall. The Wall, yeah. Um. So the the Salernitana fans did a tribute to Pink Floyd. Oh, I must check that out because uh, if there's anything that marries my interests. <laughs> like something that touches on Italian football and Pink Floyd. Yeah, yeah. You, you love the discussion they have. It's very good. Yeah. Um. So we're going to move on from football chat because I'm conscious of how many people will not give a shit. Ah, come but, here. Listen, uh, people put up a fucking baseball on the flagship. They can listen uh, to us talk soccer. Uh, <laughs> you just keep firing shots at Craig on this show. By the way, Craig is still looking um, at me. He still won't do that podcast we're supposed to do together. <laughs> Um, I will, before, as we move on though, if you're interested in that weird kind of separation of fan culture from football, there is an unbelievable book that I think you and I have talked about off air before. Um, it was definitely mentioned on a podcast we both like, or on a channel we both like, TIFO Football. Mm. And I have it right here for demonstration. It's called 1312 Among the Ultras by James Montague. Um, it's really good where like he travels around and beds in with ultras in different countries around the world and like it's some like it's some really interesting but sometimes fucking scary shit like, god shit, bless yeah. that man i have no idea how you would subject yourself to that uh, like you know investigative journalists like that they fucking yeah. balls of steel yeah all, uh, what i will say is it gives you quite a bit of perspective that if you think wrestling fans are a bit creepy and scary ain't got nothing on mm-hmm. football fans lads bunch of fucking cowards in comparison to football <laughs> fans let me tell you uh anyway it's the wrestlers are the problem <laughs> right. like, absolutely uh anyway right um let's get back into wrestling and i want to touch on a pay-per-view that happened while i was away on my jolliers um aew's wrestle dream uh the antonio Inoki tribute show nominally speaking uh, happened last Sunday. It's actually the first in the history of the company. It's the first AEW pay-per-view I have not seen live. Really? I have watched every single one of them live. Now, I've fallen asleep a couple of times and missed, like, a, a main event or two, particularly during the, like, you know, that, that early fight for the Fallen as a pay-per-view. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Era. Uh, but yes, I've seen all of them live. I've only missed like a handful of dynamites and collisions live as well, because um, I just tend to be up those hours anyway at the weekends. I, I but... was uh, I was out on on buying the pay per view up until yeah. I watched uh, Collision on Sunday morning, and I was like, "Oh God, yeah. it's gonna be a good show." And yeah. then like Sunday evening, I was watching TV with Jen, and she was like, "You gonna you gonna order the show?" I was like, oh, "I don't know." And she went to bed and I was like, fuck, I'm going to order a show. Because I've, I've ordered every single AEW pay-per-view. Yeah. Um, literally going back to when they started on, on Fight. So mm-hmm. um, so I kind of was like, oh, but like I have every pay-per-view. I, su- I suppose I should order it. So I ordered it. Um, also, cheaper than usual. It was a, a reduced price. Was it seventeen ninety five? Yeah, it was 17 dollars yeah. 99 or 95 whatever it was. Um, Americans are fucking sickened by oh, the way listen, the prices I, we pay on fights. I was telling the, a couple of the guys in the Slack. Uh, yeah, they were. They. Uh, I know a couple took a trip to Europe at the weekend. Yeah, um, but yeah. <laughs> so, have you seen the show? So I've seen what I have seen is I haven't seen the pre-show, but I do want to watch it for Claudio and Josh Barnett. Uh, and for I've heard uh, Luchasaurus and Nick Wayne over delivered. I've watched the main show up as far as I was just starting the Danielson match this okay. evening. So I've got a co- I got a couple of the big matches to go. I want to rewatch the Danielson match, and I want to rewatch the main event because I was getting tired by yeah. by the time the main event was on. Um, so I want to kind of give that a fair shake. Danielson. I've seen I, I've seen some spots from the main event and I've seen what 
happens mm-hmm. after the main event. Yeah, and uh, Dan- Danielson's saber is just fucking. It's as good as you think as it's gone. It is like it's just it's phenomenal stuff. Um, but man, I thought other than the opener, a fucking damn good pay per view. The shark has jumped on the. I I've been out on this for a couple weeks. So I was at a stage where I was warmer on it for a while because I think for a while the skits were bad. I've been I've been firmly the skits are bad since day one of the Adam Cole MJF stuff. Mm-hmm. But for a while the matches were still good. Yes, and I think for me Wembley was my tipping point. Now I think we said at the time the match was fine enough in the stadium like where from we were so we didn't get to see the yeah. whole monologue stuff and yeah and and i do insist as well i think a lot of stuff that they did in the match would have been i would have been fine with it if the turn happened at the end it yes. would have made more sense but then after watching the match after getting home i think both was said the same like the whole oh, i don't want the title if you I don't have your friendship and all that shit like just yeah. absolute bollocks, killing the fucking... I, see, that's what... It would have been fine in the context of the matches. So I was saying to our good friend, Bose Johnny, on the way out, I was like, if they had done the thing where MJF could finally trust somebody and got he... Burned. He got burned because he wanted to beat Cole, but he didn't want to hurt him. Mm-hmm. And Cole did want to hurt him to win the title. You know what I mean? Like, I kind of would have been much more permissive of how they did that finish. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah. but yeah, it's it's completely it's it's all gone now, and like I'm so as somebody who was such a high man on MJF up through like up up until this all started, like I was I championed this guy's work both in the ring because he's improved so much since 2019 when this company started, and um, his promos obviously, um, but now he's just wasting his mid-twenties on this after having career-defining feuds left, right, and center for the last two years. He's just fucking on autopilot now. Yeah, it's 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 really annoying that the world has become such an afterthought. Like, when you consider, yeah. like, the, the, the ROH tag team title seem to mean more to him at this point. Yeah, um, yeah. It's just, it's really annoying. And it's also driven by the fact that we know how good MJF is. You just said it. His, in, yeah. his in-ring stuff has just gone through the ceiling for how good he is. Um, yeah. His problems have always been if quality. They, if they had held off the Cole stuff until now and kept him as a heel and done the Orange Cassidy challenge at this pay-per-view or full gear, switch the title and let, let, let MJ off off to do that stuff with Cole, like it, we would be so much better for it because I wouldn't mind if this was in the again it's in the opening match we're getting it out of the way mm-hmm. fine but like you said he's the world champion well I mean it is the bloodline thing now because like yeah. the bloodline thing is oh if only Roman had dropped the title to Cody it wouldn't have changed anything that came after it involving the Usos and Roman yeah well if MJF dropped the title it wouldn't have changed anything that involves Roddy Strong and Adam Cole and all that carry on yeah. Um, it's just it, it's really annoying um, but anyway enough about that shit this show what you've seen so far what do you think I thought I thought Julia Hart and Chris Statland are way over delivered I think Julia Hart is now starting to visibly develop mm-hmm. as a wrestler um, in a way that a bunch of people like the Jade Cargills and others didn't yep I think she's starting to break clean of that pack. I think she is the most kind of like improved prospect in the women's roster since that run um, before she got injured and then pregnant that Ty Conti was on. Yep. Where Ty Conti was improving massively because she was working all the time and Julia Hart has been working. I think this was like her 33rd televised match. Yeah, I think she, year. She's, so she's, she's worked more than nearly anybody else on the roster this year. Like it's yeah. insane. She has got, she has benefited the most of anyone this entire company from the House of Black Mm -hmm. because the aesthetic is great. The entrance is in the top three, maybe in the company. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's really given her an aura. I think Brody King is great with her. Yeah. 
as well. Um, and then I think we're finally getting Chris Statlander back to the Chris Statlander she was before the first leg injury. Yeah. The one that I remember, I, I was looking this up in about 2018, 2019. I did a thread on Twitter about how like, I think it was 2019 because it was probably when they signed her where I was just like, people are sleeping on Chris Statlander. Like she is having all sorts of great matches with women, with men across different promotions and different styles. Like she's not all the way there yet, but she's like a a blue chipper Mm -hmm. and she's got like, she's got unbelievable physical gifts, like in terms of athleticism, in terms of size in terms of strength and I think you got to see that as well something you don't get to see in Statlander as much in the AW women's division is her being able to just like hoof around a woman and because like Julia Hart is quite diminutive and is also extremely athletic herself in her Mm -hmm. own right some of those spots that they were able to do because of that were just fantastic you know Um, I think it did start slow but I think by the like by the end they had the crowd going absolutely nuts and they did some some great spots. Um, that whole finishing sequence was fantastic. Um, yeah, I I was really impressed by it. Much as I was also impressed by the man who is just living his lifelong dream at the moment, Eddie Kingston. Yeah, <laughs> uh, is just like you want to talk about people who seem like they're booking themselves in their own dream promotion, mm-hmm. and that's Eddie right now. Uh, him and Shibata. This is also like I was getting goosebumps during this because I don't know about you, and I've yet to listen to any pods because I want to wait until I've gotten through the pay per view. But this was the most like this is fucking Shibata of the new Shibata run. Yeah, this was definitely a Shibata match without like Eddie was doing this this spinning back fist to the chest, yeah, not the head, yeah, yeah. So, but look. Look, he had his brain removed. I was just going to say, for a man that had his brain <laughs> taken out of his head, um, the fact that he's even in a wrestling ring is just amazing. And yeah, yeah, I, I fucking I love that match. That was great. It was really, really good. The only quibble I have with it slightly is the commentary where Excalibur failed to call the hesitation dropkick. It was, look at that move, was I, somebody, like, it was something like that somebody said on commentaries. That was a little bit disappointing. You, you're you're um, just hanging around with Gary Kidney too much, that's all that is. I, I'm reaching critical, yeah, I'm reaching critical mass on the let's put a bunch of tag teams I, or random people together. Fucking glazed over for that one. Yeah, except for the fact that, like, I, the the Young Bucks blew the finish. Yes, uh, first, which was first time in weird. a long time. Uh, but I want to skip straight past that yeah. and talk about the two guys that I would make my entire company in 2024 about. And that's Swerve and Hanger. I was wondering, had you seen Swerve yet? Because Swerve is a guy that we... Well, I know you, you were aware of him from Lucha Underground before. Kill shot, but, my boy. But uh, we probably saw him live together for the first time in OTT in, what, 2017? Yeah, I think, yeah, because I think he had stopped doing WXW by the time I started going. So, yeah, it probably would have been. Oh, no. Had he done the carry or the tag league? I think he might have done the WrestleMania weekend. Oh, oh mate, yeah. So, yeah, you probably yeah, would have yeah, seen yeah. him there. But, I um, think he might, he might have done WrestleCon that year. But this is a guy anyway. that we've been seeing live since 2017 at Easily. And I'm sure you hold, you hold the same opinion that I do. This guy always had it, yep. and it was just a matter of getting the like the right time, like being in the right place at the yep. right time. Um, I mean, we were both terribly disappointed by his whole presentation in WWE. Yeah, um, I think they got. I think they got about two thirds of the way there, but then slotted him in the mid card because yes. I think him as like the as like the boss of Hit Row was a good idea yes and i think they functioned well as a unit but then they slotted them distinctly mid card which was the mistake yes but this we've seen tony try a couple of different things already with, with swerve we've had the the swerve in our glory incredible tag team run and um, again a, t- a tag team that we saw a couple of times in ott yes um almost none of those matches can we comfortably talk about now <laughs> 
<laughs> that's true. Um, we're we're actually actually we are front row and at least one of them on YouTube. Yes, because uh, <laughs> I know Connor's gone back and watched it a few times. Um, I believe you can see friend of the show Jack Lazell yes. fist bump Keith Lee during one of them. You do right on his entrance, yes. Um, but yeah, we've had we've had the Swerve and Glory run. We've seen Tony trying to uh, do the the Mogul affiliates, I believe it was before it was. Mm-hmm. Um, where, where, where he got his own heavies which just unfortunately there are two absolute fucking just shit bags fucking trench trench yeah <laughs> and Parker Boudreaux that was Parker Boudreaux um, and now we've seen with the Mogul Embassy that Tony is going to give Swerve he wants this guy he knows what he has here so anyone well, that's, that, that's you know pushing for it to happen now it, like mm. yeah he'd just be hangman it's happening now yeah but let, let Tony kind of book it because he knows what he has here. Since day one, that is what the thing has been. Is like not only is Tony invested in him, but WBDR. Yeah. And they want him to put out records. They want him to be a cross media star. It is no it is no coincidence that in promotional material the network put around about AEW programming, he is usually one of the faces in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I genuinely think, and the more time goes on, the less insane a take this is, he should beat MJF. And he should do it at full gear. Um, it might be one cycle too soon for the story, but I think he needs to rescue that belt well, uh, and put it into prominent singles feuds. I, I was going to go one better. I think the... I think if MJF wants to wait for this Adam Cole thing, I think now is the time that Tony has to say, no, that's it, we're done. Cole's out for whatever amount of time he may be out, whether it's a work injury, a real injury, doesn't matter. I yeah. think the world title is no more, no more relevant to that story. Yeah. And you have yeah. Swerve, who's on this incredible, like, I know he'd just be Hangman, but it, yeah. he now feels hot. But, like, even though they, they do the thing of putting Hangman off TV a lot it's not just ever, anybody that beats him yeah he doesn't lose that often do you know what I mean he is weirdly protected for somebody that like goes missing mm-hmm. a lot um, but, I, 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 but I'd have I'd have Swerve I know he just did the Jay White thing last week but I'd have Swerve come out and challenge MJF for next week yeah I mean I, yeah like I would still because I'm I'm the classic like I, I want these things happen on the pay-per-views but um, I do think, like, even if you're going to say to MJF, no, you can't hold on to it, because, like, if if it's, like, it sounds like if it was a ligament tear and a three-part complex fracture of the ankle. That's what they're saying, yes. Like, that is, it's a little bit worse than the ankle injury I had playing football in school, and I was out eight months. Yeah. People, people are saying if it's a legit that's what the injury is. He's gone yeah. for easily nine months to a year. Now, again, I didn't have a surgery mm-hmm. because I was too young and it was a joint. So I had to wait for it to heal naturally and maybe things have advanced and maybe he can do four to six. But regardless, he is out for a while. And I would even say, like, even if you don't want to be like, no MJF, the, you can't have a title feud with... Um, Ronnie Strong. With, with Roddy Strong or with or or wait around till Cole comes back. I would I would even do the the diplomatic route would be to say, you can win it back when Cole's back. Mm-hmm. Let's just not have this thing hostage for four months. Keep doing your your skits and whatever your your plan in that you're booking in your head is, but you don't need the belt. You're fucking defending the tag team titles by yourself. Yeah, uh, like just keep doing that dumb shit if you want. There's um, plenty of fucking low end people that can be put together as a tag team to take on MJF. If, yeah. if he wants to do his fucking Hulk Hogan Triple H impression. And also, if he's not the world champion anymore, you can start beating him in some of those handicap matches. Yeah, MJF. And get sympathy, get sympathy on him as a baby face. MJF doesn't look up at the lights for anybody. No, no. He should more than he does. I think it would help him get sympathy as a baby face. But anyway. Um, yeah, the, this match was great. Like, uh, and I think these two men, like, this should be the prominent singles world title feud mm-hmm. next year. Absolutely, I'm. Ha- this is a series for me. R- run it back next year, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Swerve as a champion opens up so many. I want a Swerve Danielson feud, like you read about. <laughs> um, 
I, I, I want a swerve mox feud. I want like I, well, we, all these things I know, for the I world title. I know for title. a fact you're not the only person that wants a swerve mox feud because uh, I know mox wants that as well. Yeah, like I mean, he's one of those guys that like if you're a wrestler and if you like if you're somebody who takes a lot of pride in your work and also selfishly are somebody that wants to get over having great matches. How are you not looking at Swerve and going, I want to wrestle that guy and I want to wrestle him lots? And and here's the other thing. Look at that reaction he was getting in Seattle. Yeah. There's no reason he can't get reactions similar to that around the rest of the country once they yeah. turn him face. Also run back the um the Orange Cassidy feud mm-hmm. for the world title. Oh, there's so much you know, to do with you... him. So much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's also yeah. a new guy in the company that I think might be able to have a good match with Swerve as well. <laughs> And if he can, exactly, I would also do. I would also totally like if you're gonna if you're gonna go the other way and turn Swerve babyface as as champion, a, a, a feud with Christian oh, would be so incredible. Good, so good. <laughs> oh my god! Um, we'll talk about him in a second, but uh, yeah, that's where I stopped watching the show. So you said Danielson uh, was great. Uh, what about the six man? Any good? It, it's fine. It's you know long. Yeah. Like I say, I was, I was getting tired at this point in the show, and that wasn't a match to keep me engaged. Um, mm. So I kind of was not paying full attention to the, the show at that point. Um, Sammy is just go-away heat for me. Yeah, look, look, they're going to give Sammy another go as a heel. Um, they are saying, like, I, I saw the kind of the promo afterwards, like, Osprey is 100% in the Callis family. Yeah. Uh, which is funny for a guy that's not signed to the company to be part of an, a huge ongoing storyline. But hey, what do we know about him being, you know, his contract coming up? Um, yeah. But yeah, Ibushi is washed. It's fucking, it's not even a question of, it's, he's, he's done. I read an interview this week, which was like, even he's admitted now, he's like, I just like, every time I recover from an injury, I'm getting injured again. Like his body is just he's broken done. down. And I, and I, look, that happens. It's okay. But we need to accept it's it. it's amazing for the style he worked yeah. that he got as old as he did before the crack started. I did love show. Kenny Kenny put up a I don't know if it was a tweet or an Instagram post of them in the hotel afterwards and they happened to be watching M T V and they had on yeah. had on the uh, the video of him with the fireworks. Um that was, was losing stuff. it, yeah. Um F T R Aussie Open, slightly disappointing I thought. I was expecting a fucking another banger match of the year contender from those two. Um, yeah. but apparently Davis fucked up his wrist early on the match and what can you do yeah do you know what I would do I would uh, I would give Kyle Fletcher like a cheeky program uh, against the either the international or TNT champion hey if I wouldn't mind yeah. a series of Kyle Fletcher and Ray Phoenix matches yeah you know if indeed Ray Phoenix has the belt much longer or Ray Phoenix <laughs> is, isn't himself injured which he probably is yes yeah fucking curse title at the moment um and then yeah the the match i really really want to to see um christian cage who i feel like every day he works in this company is another day where the people that groaned at his signing are in the fucking mood yeah, remember people may were like oh it's christian why do you make such a big deal of christian fuck you that's why this guy is legitimately one of the best wrestlers of his generation I, I listen as somebody who watched his impact run and enjoyed it in real time um, and I know you were an impact watcher as well weren't you yes I was um, don't tell Gareth <laughs> I gotta keep up the bit um, yeah like uh, a lot of people like you know you'll have the WWE fan types who were like oh Ed was always superior no every, like if you watched at the time everyone knew Christian yeah. was the better wrestler yeah. Christian was the one that went outside the company and made himself an even bigger star. Um, the only thing that put Edge above him in WWE was that the main person in charge didn't like never Christian's saw face. Christian. Didn't like Christian. Yeah. It literally, that's all why. He yeah. didn't like his face. Yeah. Blue Dot. We've all heard the stories. Fucking moron. Piece of shit. Um, but let's... I, I'm aware that we're going on so long. This is now... By the way, guys, if you haven't figured out already, this is because there is shit all to talk about on Thunder. But the the main reason I wanted to bring up Wrestle Dream was to talk about after this match. A favorite of the podcast. <laughs> Adam Copeland arrived. And I've seen this video. 
and what I will say about it. Like, again, I, I think I mentioned it on the show. At least I've definitely said it to you. Where it's like, look, anybody that comes over, I'll give them a chance. Yep. And I'll usually give what my rule of thumb is in AEW is about th- somewhere between three and six months for them to work out all their bad ideas that WWE wouldn't let them do. And then they kind of figure out they're not going to get over doing that. And then they start being good. I present to you Miro as the primary example of that, where he was doing his best man gimmick for months, video game shit, uh, before he was like, uh, this isn't working. Mm-hmm. And then became the redeemer. Um, so I think with that in mind, I think the execution of this debut was very good. I think having the theme music was a masterstroke. I think it is one of the funniest things I've ever heard that WWE let the rated R superstar trademark lapse. Not once, but twice. That is incredible. Because they, they don't normally slip like that. Mm-hmm. And That's uh, what happens now that McDevitt's retired. I eh? saw a great thing where the rumor seems to be that Edge was aware that it slipped in 2020. Yeah. And he said nothing. Hmm. He knew. Yeah. Like, th- th- this is the thing people forget. Edge very nearly signed with AEW before going back. Yeah. yeah and th- the other thing that you forget because he's such a, like, a WWE lifer to this point, as he is actually a big wrestling fan. Mm hmm. Like, and that's something that when he did the podcast with Christian. And when he did the the network show, which is maybe the, the best, best thing piece of original they, yeah. content they ever put out, absolutely, you actually got to see a little bit of that. That he's so he loves wrestling, and I think he was too big a star to leave before AEW because nowhere else would pay him the level that he had earned. Mm-hmm. Um, I I do not blame him for like not going to to TNA. Do you know what I mean? Because they wouldn't offer him the mo- nearly the money he, he, will, he would want. Been making, yeah. yeah, same with New Japan and stuff like that. So, but I do get the sense that, and I listen. I listen to his presser afterwards, and this is a guy who is fucking jazzed to work with people. The Tony Khan's thing was he's here full time. That's he's yeah. wrestling more than you've seen him wrestle in the past decade. Yeah. Now, if tonight, because we're recording this before Dynamite, he sits down for 20 minutes in the middle of With the spotlight. ring. spotlight. Oh, fuck. Yeah. No, that's not going to happen. I, I will start to hate this. And I will really hope that he'll get through this period and not do that forever. I think... The- At least all the other things he could do with, like... Brood Edge and shit like that. That's all lockdown IP wise. Yeah. So he can't do that even if he wanted to. The, look, we, I've been the hardest person on Edge that you'll find online. Yeah. <laughs> um, WWE treat him like this fucking caricature of a person. He was the he was one of the examples in my lifetime. One of the main examples in my lifetime of. WWE telling you a guy was the top star so hard that some people started to believe it. Yeah, but also, this was a case of where, like, again, you go back to 2004, 2005, he was, even 2002, he was organically one of the top baby faces during the SmackDown 6 yes. era. Or, like, totally yep. organically, he got, got over because he had Heyman behind him. And then 2004, 2005, he started to kind of manic heel. Like he, he started transitioning to that kind of manic heel that he became. Started tra- transitioning to that place. Um, but again, he before they fully got right behind him as that heel, he was a uh, he was um, really kind of. I'd say. Again, organically over as a heel, like he, the the Sean, the initial Shawn Michaels feud. I think that's where he turned, wasn't it? Um, yeah. And the Benoit feud, kind of like he he was good, but then they they really kind of that's when they start pushing him as like Cena's rival, and and he mm-hmm. was like him, Orton, and Cena were like the top three guys, and no matter what, they don't forget Big Dave. Oh yeah, Big Dave, sorry as well. But they were they were just like hammering you that Edge was this massive massive star. Yeah. He was in the Attitude Era, so he's a huge star, and that's what it became. Um, 
Yeah. But look, you you said it. He is a lifelong wrestling fan. He absolutely thinks of himself as an actor. So he does have these kind of wild ideas. He's not totally blameless for how he's pre- he, presented. He's always down for some hot thespian action. Yes. A great tweet that, like I said to you before, didn't get enough love. Mm-hmm. Um, he definitely does have some really bad ideas. And he isn't faultless when it comes to his WWE presentation. But like you, I am 100% willing to give him time to figure out. And I think there's enough people in the back that he knows and will listen to. Whether it's Jericho, Moxley, Christian, Christian. FTR. That are going to go, no, no, you don't need to do this. You have the freedom to just be a wrestler. There's no shame yeah. in being a wrestler in this company. Yeah. Because they're all guys like Jericho. Like the, the famous thing with Jericho is he went to New Japan and was like, hang on, I, I can do what I want. Yeah. And when AEW came up, he was like, absolutely, I don't want to go back to that other place because I don't get to do what I want there. The whole thing with mm-hmm. Moxie is I don't care what they offer me. I'm never going back. Um, FTR came in had like you said bad ideas worked it out became one of the best tag teams in the world again yeah you know it, it, you give these guys a chance I think I think Edge can be he might not be the rating straw he never has been but I think he can absolutely contribute to uh, to this company yeah um before we go into 99 i think this would be a good uh a good little um uh, opportunity for some uh some shameless plugging uh lee what has been happening we had a busy week while i was gone on the patreon yeah jesus we dropped so much patreon content in the last week <laughs> um what have we put up i know yesterday or well the so we we started with a poll we did so at the movies is coming back and it's the spooky edition uh and if i recall correctly our options in that poll um so this is our movie show by the way that happens on patreon so it was um they live was one uh wrestlers versus zombies another um we have river of darkness starring half the tna roster and doom from 2005 and we can exclusively reveal now that uh, coming next week at largemanappears.com will be the At The Movies review of They Live. Cult classic. Winning with 67% of the vote. I'm relieved at that. Yeah. Um, yeah, looking forward to that one. But that wasn't all, as we said. There was also a show notes dump of your notes from the months of both August and September. That went live, I think, the following day. And then we had the final, absolutely final TRL episode in season two as we reviewed the uh, Australian uh, comedy, I don't know, uh, yeah. Her- Hercules Returns, as uh, nominated by uh, listener Nathan Moore. Mm-hmm. And uh, then we had Your Baby. The interview with ah yes Chris. with uh, Chris Chris Landis. Yes. I was like, are you talking about my show notes no, dump? No, I no. wouldn't call that of it. So yes, I did my show notes dump of like all my all the 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 typed notes I do for these shows mm-hmm. and the paywall shows. But then yes, we dropped the kind of post season wrap up of Masters of the Dragon Star, our WMSC Masters series that we we just did on the Patreon, uh, and we finished up by sitting down with the author of Quest for the Dragon Star, Christopher Landis. That show is free, by the way, on Patreon. So if you were kind of wondering what some of the paywall content is like. You can hop over to alargemanappears.com right now and without even putting down your five Europeans, uh, you can listen to that that particular uh, show. So uh, enjoy that uh, because it was a really, really good chat uh, with Chris and we'll be delighted to have him back when we eventually get around to doing season two. And like I say, and two nights before you hear this, we had uh, Lonely Audio uh, returned with a new solo project i did a watch along of the first ever monday night raw from january 11th 1993 Ooh! so if that sounds like something you might enjoy like you say hop over to the patreon 
because I will I will continue to do that for my solo shows. I think I'll do the the kind of watch alongs. I might might stick with Raw. Might jump around a little bit. Who knows? Yeah, um, that's great because it'll give it a different flavor to uh, Grab Bag Radio, mm-hmm. which we alternate month on month off with, uh, which is my show where I usually take uh, listener questions, talk about everything I've been watching currently, and then some other stuff that's been kind of in my craw and the the news of twenty twenty three wrestling. Um, but yeah, that's largemanappears.com. Like I said, five euro, uh, which is about like six to seven dollars, I think, um, for the month gets you at least three bonus podcasts. Um, and then we'll have like polls for things like at the movies. We'll usually have the show notes dump. Uh, when I finally get caught up on it, I usually post my match of the year tracking spreadsheet um, every month or two. Um, so you can keep an eye on that. And then any other dumb ideas. The end of this month, we're going to, of course, have our third annual Arquetta Ween as we review Scream 3. Um, and yeah, a bunch of other crap like that, um, which is very enjoyable. There's a lot of stuff on there that like, even if you're just signing up for one or two months, that you are literally getting dozens of shows now mm-hmm. uh, at this stage. Um so it's it's it every month it increases in value and i don't want to be like hey this is a great month to sign up but it is because again like that's just the stuff lee just outlined there is just stuff that's popped up in the last week and we've got at least three more bits of audio coming uh over october um so you can you can check that shit out 1999 lee (laughs) it's time to talk about it can't dance around it much further but uh if you've been a recent listener to the show You'll know we have a new segment uh, to set the context for Thunder. Not watching Nitro necessarily, although we did watch the Nitro this week on our last uh, Voices of Wrestling episode. Um, but what we started doing is uh, I'm having a read of The Observer to talk about like the week in wrestling. What's happening uh, in the world, in uh, not just the world of Dave Meltzer, but in the world of wrestling uh, in this week in 1999. And um, I'll tell you, it's a big one. Uh, this week it's uh, so the thunder will be covering is on the 12th the the observer co- came out on the 16th a few days after this um, and <laughs> what they had to talk about was mainly the hall of fame and we did on our last show the big list of people oh, that were yes. eligible for the hall of fame this year um, and we had four successful inductees um, I didn't check to see if this was ever beaten, but uh, certainly in 1999, Dave was confident this would never be beaten. Going in with 95% of the ballot was Jushin Liger. I don't think it's been beaten because the big thing a couple of years ago was Okada. Yeah. And everyone's saying, oh, well, he's such a lock that I'm not going to vote for him. Um, yeah. And I believe Okada, I think he got like around high 80s, maybe low 90s, but I don't think he beat the 95%. Mm. Yeah, so 95%. Now, it is worth noting that Dave says here, I think it's 83 ballots were sent out. So it's obviously a lot more ballots now oh, yeah. uh, get sent out. Uh, just by virtue of the fact that I personally know multiple people who get ballots <laughs> yeah. for the, the Observer Hall of Fame. So it's definitely much bigger than just 83 people across the whole world. But uh, yeah, it's going to be hard to ever top that. Going in with him as well, um, it's an interesting mix. Uh, Lioness Asuka goes in, I think well-deserved. Your boy, Muto. Of course. And Jim Ross. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and he does Dave does cite in a very Dave way where he's not directly saying it but it certainly implies it that the he got over the line because of the surviving the two bouts of Bell's palsy oh, that Jesus. people were just like fucking uh, that people are just like it's the kind of not a sympathy vote but kind of like hell yeah this guy kept yeah, going yeah. at a pretty high level in spite of that kind of vote Um, like we were talking about it on the last one where it was sort of an edge case but also sort of this year or two period is probably his peak mm-hmm. between now and 2001 so if he's not going in by 2001 he's not going in um so yeah he's in <laughs> um there is a let me have a look here cuz he lists who drops off so getting less than 10% of the vote and dropping off next year's balloting are Curtis Ikea, Bill Miller, Massa Saito, Tiger Jeet Singh, Sergeant Slaughter, Kerry Von Erich and Steve Williams. Mm-hmm. Uh we have this week as well WWF officially confirming their intention to go public. Uh what I found very interesting about this 
is Dave talking about how he was kind of wondering out loud whether he goes well it's a wise company move because it's basically going to erase all the company's debt so a few years like it was at the previous year 1998 they they leveraged titan towers against uh, i think it was a 14 million dollar bank loan mm-hmm. it was to help pay for a bunch of overheads to help secure the tyson deal for mania 14 big big gamble so not only are they able to write off all the company debt with the amount they expect to get, like I think they're hoping for an initial public offering of a uh, hundred and eighty something million just for the class A shares, which are the ones that aren't controlled by Vince. Um, but he wonders, even though it's a good move for the company, um, he wonders, is it a good move for the consumer? to buy shares in WWF which might seem crazy but he makes a very good point that to everybody WWE are either at or approaching the peak yes which is not when you want to buy shares you want to buy shares when they're at a low ebb like if this was 95 96 it makes good sense mm-hmm. to you know because you're not going to lose much on WWF shares they can really only go up from how bad things were in the mid 90s Whereas now it's going to cost you quite a lot and how much more can this company possibly grow? So I kind of, I, I kind of like in an economic sense, I understand that. Uh, what's interesting is my understanding of when you prepare a company for an IPO is that part of your prospectus for investing, the company has to give an honest accounting of the risks involved with investing with them. Okay. So it was interesting to me to see Dave lists the 10 reasons that WWF gave why you wouldn't want to invest in WWF. Would you like to hear that? Oh, absolutely. So uh, I won't dwell too long on any of these again because there's 10 reasons. But uh, one, failure to continue to create popular live events and television. Uh, Then failure to retain and continue to recruit key performers. Um. Loss of the creative services of Vince McMahon due to retirement, disability, or death, noting the company does not carry key man life insurance on McMahon in case of unexpected misfortune. I'm sure that part has changed oh, yeah, since. Absolutely. Uh, especially since he became a shoot billionaire a couple of months after this. Uh, failure to maintain and uh, current TV and pay per view deals. I mean, that makes a lot of sense considering what you see happens in WCW two years later. Mm-hmm. That even though, like, the the ratings had tanked people still saw it as you know a thing they might want to purchase because they had a tv, TV deal had so TV as luna is a wrestling company yeah. as luna is a wrestling company especially in that day and age lost a tv deal that's it dead in the water uh failure to be able to compete with wcw is number five then an economic decline in the country leaving consumers with less disposable income uh which they which some point to as the key problem facing pro wrestling in japan at the moment uh, potential inadequate insurance coverage. Uh, potential legal regulations that keep them from promoting live events due to those legal regulations, uh, regulations such as states adopting laws strengthening the regulation of live events. Uh, nine, substantial legal liabilities if pending litigation is resolved unfavorably. Mentioned in particular are the lawsuit over the death of Owen Hart, as well as outstanding lawsuits filed by former performers Jim Helwig, uh, William Eady, and Randy Colley, and one filed by World Championship Wrestling. Uh, Eady is seeking $6.5 million in compensatory damages and unspecified punitive damages based on a Wisconsin lawsuit filed in 1991 where he claimed WWF had a verbal agreement with him to compensate him for his idea of the demolition tag team and employ him for life. Uh, Collie filed a 1992 lawsuit in Connecticut also claimed he wasn't compensated for giving Titan the idea of a tag team called Demolition and the two cases have been combined uh, have been combined into one uh, which doesn't have a definite date for a trial we all know the the, the warrior stuff the WCW uh, lawsuit was filed in May 1998 was a countersuit to the one um, filed in 1996 <laughs> by WWF against them at uh, they accused uh, Titan of breaching its contract with High Road Productions Incorporated of Canada over wrestling with shadows. 
Um, and then we obviously know the own heart, the own heart one as well. Uh, number 10, in expanding, um, oh, sorry, there's 11. In expanding into new or contemporary uh, complementary businesses, there has been talk in recent weeks and months of trying to use Ken Shamrock to expand into either the current UFC or develop a UFC-like event, being that the main demographic for both forms of entertainment are similar. It's interesting now that they're all one company. Mm-hmm all these years later to hear that and my final one which is my favourite one in the whole list year 2000 computer problems causing unexpected additional costs the millennium bug oh, of course <laughs> um, so yeah those are the reasons that WWF think you shouldn't invest in WWF um, uh, an interesting note on the Knights of Nitro show that we just did which was the uh, Jericho debut versus the um, the red and yellow Hogan the red and yellow Hogan Nitro. Uh, the biggest gap in ratings, we talked about how Raw stomped them. Mm-hmm. Um, but the biggest gap in ratings was uh, 6.87 on Raw for the HBK Jesse Ventura segment. Okay. Versus 2.25 for Eddie and Ray versus the Brits. Oof. Uh, in the news this week as well, Jackie, Sa- uh, Jackie Sato dies. Um, famous name in in Japanese women's wrestling. Um, New Japan are being forced by... So basically, they have a big uh, show coming up in Jingu Stadium. WCW have told them, you can't have any of our guys. And they're like, fuck. Uh, So now they are back negotiating at the table with uh, Nobuhiko Takada to come in and wrestle Sasaki uh, at that show to have some sort of big match. Uh, on the the marquee uh there's a couple more kind of like uh flying bits of news i want to mention that are just kind of like interesting tidbits uh that i'll just uh fly through uh indie wrestler i love this story indie wrestler jay rogstad J rock of all american wrestling decided to hold his wedding wedding as part of a recent wrestling show which isn't a first but it isn't like it happens every day either he married the former Barb Tamborella at the matches in Fall Creek, Wisconsin last month. Fans attended the show didn't know in advance a wedding would be taking part as <laughs> of the wrestling festivities. Um, uh, Chris Chavez, the former Tatanka, will be working for Hammerlock Wrestling in the UK. Um, the a very infamous TV show, NBC's Secrets of Pro Wrestling, will air on Sky One this <sighs> week in the UK. Oh, I remember it well. Yes, that's a stunt granny. <laughs> I'll have you know. Um, the first ECW and TNN show happened this week as well, but it was uh, I know I, this was a tidbit I didn't know is that the first ECW on TNN show was a highlight show. It was because Heyman didn't like the show they shot. Yes, so it was styled as a hype package to get you ready for the real debut. The following of the 20th. yes. Um, yeah, um, do you, do you, did you not know that that story that they they went and shot a TV no. show, and Heyman thought it was so shit that he refused to send it to the network. <laughs> so when TNN cancelled them a year later, it's definitely not because Heyman was a fucking prick. Yeah, or a maniac. Yeah, or a coked up loon, or all all allegedly, of the allegedly, allegedly, allegedly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, at the moment, this is really interesting for the way history would go. At the moment, Taz is telling people he's leaning towards staying in ECW oh really yeah so he's going back and forth I don't know whether the numbers aren't adding up yet or or what Paul is pulling out of his arse to promise him but yeah that's what he's saying um then our final stuff are like the the WCW notes as we pull in to start talking about Thunder so do you remember we saw the four multiple covers of TV guides that they promoted Mm -hmm. on the show well apparently (laughs) The actual story in TV Guide is a fairly realistic and sobering burial of the country. Um, it portrays them as a struggling company losing the ratings war. There's going to be another TV Guide article about that in the next week or two written by Phil Mushnick. Oh, lovely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Ric Flair missed the uh, the Nitro on the 9th of August after returning from Japan due to a back injury. But as Dave mentions here, because he's not going to outright say it uh, necessarily himself about his friend Rick, he goes, but he was also asked to put Shane Douglas over clean. Flair told friends he's more than willing to lose to Benoit or Kidman, but that Douglas hadn't gotten over was drawing poor quarter hours, a record low the week before, and didn't deserve it. 
Those in the company that normally complain about the old guys not putting over new guys were sympathetic on this account because Flair was the only superstar to work with and elevate the second tier guys. Although it didn't elevate anyone, just moved himself into being a second tier guy. Oof, that's so <laughs> the fucking feeling is true. <laughs> yeah, the flair. Uh, the feeling is flair wasn't asked because of business, but because of the feel. Uh, the feeling this would be the ultimate personal humiliation for him, since for whatever reason, um, Bischoff personally has never gotten over his hatred for him. He had also talked of doing the opposite of everyone else, in that flair wanted to be taken off television, but wanted to continue working house shows, which is exactly the opposite of the other big names. Uh, Bischoff wanted to turn Hogan back heel this week. <laughs> saying the face turn hadn't worked and pointing to the ratings. Hogan's doing the red and yellow on Monday was his step in trying to prove Bischoff wrong because he didn't want to turn back so quickly. At one point, Bischoff wanted to book a heel Hogan beating Bret Hart in the main event of the A23 Nitro in Las Vegas. Of course he did. Rather than saving it for the fall brawl pay-per-view as originally planned. That seems to have fallen apart though as Hart is said to be training like crazy for his comeback and recognising he has a lot to prove to everybody but there is no definitive time or even programme for him anymore. Um, So that's pretty much it on the WCW notes unless you're somebody who's like really a big sicko about getting into the financials of the company at the moment what they're doing on house shows. Uh, Medusa did have her surgery just though just there uh her match is off at road wild no word if brandy alexander will replace her against mona or if there will be a women's match at all stay tuned for the end of the podcast on that one uh, at thunder during sid's run-in there was a big explosion in the building that was never referred to on the air it sounded like maybe somebody was taking a shot like with a gun at sid actually there was a pyro explosion and both of the guys who handled for the pyro for wcw were injured and taken to oh, the hospital fuck. One has second degree arm uh, burns on his arm and back. They had no more pyro for the rest of the tapings. And I'm going to leave it at the... Oh, uh, Mean Gene's uh, contract is up soon. Uh, a wrestler named Devin Storm has signed a developmental deal and will be reporting to the power plant. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's Young Crowbar, mm-hmm. who will be on TV less than a year from now. Apparently, the rumors have gotten out about Tori Wilson and Kidman dating. Um... Shannon Moore and Shane Helms are also now in the power plant. Um, And finally, um, and I'm just going to leave it at this one sentence because we all know how harrowing the implications of this is. Dustin Runnels should be back imminently. I don't know if everybody knows uh, what the future holds in store. But uh, the phrase supernatural peace (laughs) fire comes to mind. (laughs) Think of a Brit re- I personally of, can't wait to talk about that. Think of a Brit rest wrestler with white face. <laughs> Outside your window. They're all I mean they're all fairly pale <laughs> in Brit rest, so it's not it's not a million miles off. Right. Man, man, got, let's get ready. Man have I got an idea for when NXT Europe comes returns. Uh, this is a really bad thunder. Uh, we'll talk about it. <laughs> you're not, in a second. You're, this is a poor. There's no pretense here, is there? <laughs> this is a shocking. For the 75th edition we've covered, this is a shocking, piss poor attempt at a TV show, but we'll talk about it in a second. This is Thunder 75 from La Crosse, Wisconsin. 12th of August, 1999. It's a 2.9 rating. It's up by 0.3 for this piece of shit. Um. The reason I say this is terrible and one of the worst thunders is exactly why in some cases, and in Lee Malone's case, I know you were quite positive on it. It's because fuck all happens. It's an on the network version. The network edit is one hour and 16 minutes. There are four matches. Three of them are squashes. I would be, three of them are squashes. And the other one I don't think goes over five minutes either. Mm-hmm. Um... The only, yeah, the only one that isn't a squash match almost immediately goes to a commercial break. And is a fucking mess of a um, match as well. They replay in full. Three matches? Two, is it two matches or three? So on the version we watched, it was two matches. But according to, so Cage Match has the listing for this show wrong. And the way they've listed it makes me think on the original TV edit, they showed three full matches. So they show the main event of this Thunder is the Nitro main event we just reviewed. Recapped in full. In full. Um, entrances and all. The, entrances and all. Uh, what was the other... Oh, the Booker versus Canyon yes. match. 
And then the other match that was supposed to be that uh, it looks like on Cage Match they reshowed in full was the US title. But match. that was on this. It was, but it was it was it kind was, of clipped. It was. It was yeah. edited down. It was edited down. What they did show, I, like, okay, no, I'll get into that in a second. I, I will. I have that written down. Then there's just video packages ago. Mm-hmm. That's basically what this show is. It's horseshit, but let's talk about it anyway. Eh? Uh, we get a cold open on a music video for uh, that kind of recaps previous trips to Sergis, what kind of infamous or, and famous things have happened at Road Wild pay-per-views before. We get to see bikinis and Jay Leno. And if you like that video package, Lee, I've got great news for you because in one hour and 16 minutes, we see this video package twice. Yes, we do. <laughs> Uh, we go straight then to uh, our opening contest, a fucking Matt classic. Uh, you, by way of sometimes whichever one of us gets to the show first, if it starts off particularly bad, we'll let each other know. All you did was screenshot to me the line in your notes that said Rick Steiner versus Spider. Yes. Fuck me. Spider, who we have not seen since those Eddie Guerrero vignettes. Yes. What well, is it had to be a year ago at this stage, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so we we kind of, I think we touched on at the time that he was training to be a wrestler. So this is his actual first appearance on Thunder, I think. I don't recall him. Oh, it's his first appearance yeah. on Thunder. It's his first time I've ever seen him wrestle. Um, he looks like absolute shit. Yeah. Just does look, he literally looks like a guy that has no place on TV. Um, fair, now, fair play to Rick. I was just going to say, fair play to Rick Steiner. He actually brings the TV title with him this week. Yes. One thing I will say in Spider's defense is that they didn't put him in there with somebody that had any interest in making him look like a pro wrestler. No. Um, Rick, Rick Steiner, as we've pointed out many times, is just fucking shit. Like, I mean, look. It, and at a terrible bloke. Yeah. I mean, a, an absolute piece of shit. Human being. And uh, he has no interest in putting on good matches or making his opponents look in any way good, unless he is afraid that they're going to fight back against him. Yeah. Yeah, the very rare opportunity. Like, on Monday, we were talking about how, oh, he's not doing any of his fucking about with, like, Goldberg. Mm-hmm. You know, because Goldberg would fucking rinse yeah. him. Uh, it's not even that, like, you know, Rick Steiner would probably hold his own against Goldberg. That, that's not in doubt. But it's the fact that yeah. he's a bully, and he doesn't want to take that chance. So, yeah. I mean, this this, this so, is just shit. This plays out like every Rick Steiner match against uh, like a low car, a lower card job guy you've ever seen where he just fucking takes liberties and roughs this guy up. There is one particularly egregious case of... So, like, I'm not somebody that pearl clutches about guys doing dangerous spots. So, like, I don't get on board with the... Do you remember my favorite one of all time was the people hand-wringing about that incredible incredible Lance Archer Marco Stone squash oh, match I fucking love that match one of the greatest squash matches I've ever seen in my life and people were like oh my god poor Marco yeah. I'm like no when both participants are willing and they actually do it in a way where it looks devastating but it is in fact safe I'm, I'm all for it what I take exception to is when one participant in a match clearly does not have a regard for the safety of the other person mm-hmm. and there is one particular spot in this match where that sticks out like a sore thumb i'll mention it in a second so this is where uh Tanay and larry remind you and it would have been our first time learning it had we not watched nitro that the stip for the world title match uh at the weekend is now loser leaves wcw yes. Rick uh, gets on the microphone because that's all. The only thing we want more than a Rick Steiner match to Open Thunder is a Rick Steiner promo. So we get a few, like a very short promo here where he says he's going to beat Goldberg unmercifully at Road Wild. Road Wild calls him a bald headed goofball. Um, and then I wrote, it's the usual Rick versus Jobber match. Uh, he throws Spider about. He's pulling and clawing at his face. Does a a pretty rough looking release German suplex. Then the spot comes, and I think you know exactly what I'm talking about because I jumped out of my chair. Okay. He throws Spider out of the ring, clatters him into the rail, removes the mat. 
goes to do a pile driver and releases him halfway down. He did. It wasn't uh, wasn't the most pleasant of experiences, I'd say, for uh, one spider. A release pile driver on the concrete. There, I don't think there's a wrestler on earth I would trust to have the precision to keep me safe on that. No. Like, I, I would not trust Brian Danielson to keep me safe on that. But also, you th- know? this is Rick Steiner doing this with a guy who was probably fresh out of the power plant. Yeah. Well, as I was going to say, Rick isn't trying to keep no. him safe. <laughs> like, he doesn't give a shit, is the thing. And, like, thank God for, for Spider. That, like, his, the margin of error yeah. is so... Like, it doesn't bear thinking of it, you know? Um, but it was a scary moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, back in uh, Spider I don't know whether he had had his bell rung or whether he just again is it's just that he's green as grass he does not get in position it's obviously supposed yeah. to be the top rope bulldog so he does like a Kane-esque flying clothesline um, and then puts him in a Kimura and taps him for the win now I will say the, the clothesline and then doing the Kimura a bit of quick thinking to not just redo a spot for a fuck finish because like you could have done the fucking was... Sean Vader come down slap him scream move <laughs> and then do the bull just go back and do the bulldog this looks a bit more organic but that is like I'm really scraping to give any credit to anything that happened here um, this is the new bar for how reckless Rick Steiner was being around the time which is like a matter of like uh, Everyone knew it at the time. And I think uh, it only gets worse when Scott returns. Yes. Yeah. Oh, like, uh, uh, towards the end Oh, I, I, I know later company. on, like, in 2000, they do yeah. them around a weekly where they're just taking liberties. Yeah. But I think even when Scott mm. returns later on in a couple of weeks, I think there there's a couple of incidents we'll see. We get a hat trick of flashbacks. We do. The first is the Hogan and Nick Hogan giving him the red and yellow tights and him being attacked, coming back, blah, blah, blah. Um, then we that they, this feels like a personal troll effort to me because they replay They showed this twice in its entirety at Nitro and they made us rewatch the entire dusty backstage chat with the revolution again. So this is what the third time we've seen this this week. Yes. And it wasn't even like whatever about if this was an unbelievable history. Like if this was Brett with the steel plate, I'd be like, fair enough. That's a big moment. Drive that shit home, yeah. Yeah. This is David Flair. It's not that deep, lads. Um, And then they show a kind of clip down version of the US title match. And then we get the third flashback, which was to Thunder last week. So something we've also already seen, which was Sid threatening to beat dozens of men a night to try and outdo Goldberg's streak and be the, the Millennium Man. Funny that, that Sid is in a feud with Sting, but is also calling out Goldberg on, on a weekly basis. I have I, I am very confident he has no idea what he's doing. Um, we then get, I think, Lee's catharsis match of the night. A two-on-one handicap match. Sid versus disorderly conduct. Do you want to walk us through this one? He power bombs one. He choke slams the other. I mean, what, what's there to fucking know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know I love me some disorderly conduct. Um, They just get their fucking heads kicked in. I think uh, there's, there's a brief moment in the match where Sid has one of them in the corner. And he's just slapping him. He literally just holding him in the corner. Yeah, slapping he's him. just slapping him. <laughs> yeah. Also, in... <laughs> Also, in classic Sid Vicious fashion, I am ninety five percent sure he pinned the illegal man. Doesn't matter. I was I was expecting I thought to pin the other guy as well. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I thought was going to happen. The bell was going to ring, and then when the spotlight shone on him, uh, like the lights get cut, and there's just a spotlight on him and the remaining disorderly conduct man dead on the floor. I thought he was going to pin him because they are doing the thing about the yeah. streak where they're trying to like just just flat out lie it, it's, about how it's people he's been. Post rolled wild where he comes out and does the pins multiple people in not in like matches he's not involved in. Um, yeah, yeah. I will say that shot of Sid on his knees and the lights going down in the background as Sid cuts a promo yeah. to the camera. Brilliant. I thought it was great. It should have been. It should have been cut, cut off about five to ten seconds. Oh yeah, he, he ran out of material. Does. Yeah, but. He ran out of material, but that didn't stop no, him talking. I thought, it was a great, I thought that was a great shot. 
Um, and I, yeah. I adore since WCW music. I know it's not good. I and, just think it, it's great. No. And it just it ends with him just screaming, "I am." I am, which is right of that bowler. Yeah. You know that that clip of the bowler. Do you know who you are? Mm-hmm. I am. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was uh, AJ's TNA music, wasn't it? You are, you are. Yeah, I yeah. am, I am. I am, I am. A pioneer, this Sid. I'll tell you. Uh, we then get another flashback to Nitro, which is the Deadpool jumping Eddie and Ray, and then getting saved by Kidman. We then get. <laughs> I wrote Sturge's video again. This show sucks. <laughs> It's the full. We literally saw it twenty it's minutes the, the, ago. It's the exact same video, yeah. Um, I will say the uh, next the next uh, video package, very good. Yes, it it chronicles the entire history of Harlem Heat, the, and then the breakup, and them coming back together. Very good. It shows when they take their time and put the effort in, they were still capable of doing these things well. There are two promo, two video packages on this yes. show. That do a very good job of putting the context for a big match at the pay per view. Mm-hmm. So I uh, and that is what a go home show. If you we've said this countless times about go home thunders, if you were going to use it as the video package show, make them this kind of video yeah. package that at the end of the show I'm like I need to pay my my cash to see these matches happen. Um, unfortunately they don't do that for anything else really apart from one other thing on this show but it was a deadly video package I really really liked it voiceover and everything you know they actually care about video package when there is voiceover Um, they show the whole Booker versus Canyon match from Nitro again then we see something that was cut from that Nitro which was the Chad Brock concert and preceding promo from the Rednecks So, uh, Kurt Hennig cut a promo on Chad Brock, who I had not heard of before or since. He seems to be a small Um, little country man. Yes, he's a small little country man. He's just like, just add water to get Garth Brooks. (laughs) Um, He says if Chad Brock comes and sings his song, he will kick his fat ass. I really like Kurt Hennig. Uh, He keeps calling him Chad Flop as well, which is great. Then uh, I was just going to say, say, isn't the thing that Chad Brock was actually a wrestler? Oh, it could. I think I think somebody somebody was telling us this. It could have been in the Discord that Chad Brock did actually wrestle. Ah, well, it this makes a lot of sense because this is the first person like who has gotten physically involved. I was just going to say because he has a really bad pull apart brawl, so he must be a wrestler. Yeah, he must at least fancy himself as one anyway. Um, so we see the Brock, uh, the Chad Brock concert later, and the camera whip pans across to him and Kurt Hennig having a stare down during the concert, and they have a bad pull apart ball brawl with the Rednecks, and then of all people, the Revolution come out to get Chad Brock's Those back. Bastions of country music, the Malenko, yeah, 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 pretty Saturn, <laughs> Chris Benoit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sake. Uh, speaking of. The Revolution, uh, their two members, Dean Malenko and Shane Douglas, wrestle Barry Windham and Bobby Duncan Jr. in a team that it will henceforth be referred to on this show as Windcom. <sighs> Dave, come on. <laughs> you thought you thought you were over the Bobby Duncan pun names, didn't you? I, I, I know you're taking the loss of uh, Mike Enos very hard. I am. You just, you just really miss your anus, but I do, I do. I've thought about getting medication. <laughs> wind, wind come is just bad. <laughs> that, that's real bad. <laughs> it's, it's iconic. Uh, what, but what if it's Kendall Windham? <laughs> wind, no, yeah, you would buy the T-shirt. Wind come, there she blows. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> In the AJ Styles jeans, I was right? just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <sighs> my my point is... Sorry, my vision's got all blurry now. <laughs> fucking hell. <laughs> if uh, if it's not Barry Windham, if it's Kendall Windham, is it Windcomb too? <laughs> No, I'd have to workshop that a bit more. 
because, you know, wind come took so much thought. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's get back to... I ro- I, yeah. Is, 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 I, I ro- is this Shane Douglas's okay. in-ring return? Yes, well, on the podcast it is. Has he wrestled on it's Nitro? His, it's his debut. Um, I can find out for you. Well, he's only been around a hot second. Um, this is definitely his... Definitely uh, his Days his, of Thunder his debut. podcast yes. debut. Yes. Um... um I don't know. But yeah, walk us through this one while I look it up. I mean, I thought this match fucking stunk. Um, yeah. Barry Windham was probably the best wrestler in the match, which is saying something. Even Malenko seemed yeah. a little bit off. Um, I, I thought it was it was interesting that like Shane Douglas was still in good enough shape at this was. point that he wasn't wrestling with the t-shirt on. But it was very funny that I said that and then immediately saw Barry Windham get into the ring, who was very much in the t-shirt on <laughs> phase of his career. Um, yeah, no, I, I will give him credit. Shane Douglas actually looked like he got into good shape for this run. Um, yeah, he definitely looked barrel chested by his own standards. I will say yeah. though. Oh yes. But, um, w- n- Shane Douglas wrestled Scott Putsky in his oh, okay. Nitro debut. Of course. Which I believe was the week after the Knights of Nitro we did where he debuted. Ah, okay. Be- um, because remember, we, we were confused at the time. We thought the Scott Putsky match was his debut, but it wasn't. The What was I going to say? Um, yeah, I, I will say credit to credit Douglas. He looks well, but the match did fall apart as soon as himself and Bobby Duncombe Jr. got in the ring. They had multiple yeah. spots where they just seemed lost with each other. Can I, can I just say, by the way, I, I'm just looking at, you know, Shane Douglas. Uh, you may not think he's a great wrestler, but in some ways he's an elite worker. Uh, his farewell from ECW, he had a four-match run where he was obviously doing a program with Just Incredible. Was, because that's where Francine because it's. Yeah, so there is four matches. There is a Douglas and Dreamer versus the Impact players. And then three... Uh, Shane Douglas just incredible matches Shane Douglas won three of those four matches and the other one was a no contest just incredible never got his win back wow <laughs> fucking hell <laughs> I can't believe him and let him away with that one yeah very funny very very funny um, anyway yeah this match stunk yeah it wasn't great um I think the the only things that I uh, enjoy in this match, I think Bobby Duncan hit a pretty decent looking shoulder breaker for a two count at one point. Um, I enjoyed Larry putting over Pittsburgh and also using the opportunity to mention Shane Douglas and Pittsburgh to put himself over by saying that he was one of Shane Douglas's heroes growing <laughs> up. Um, and then also, um, I, I, I like the Pittsburgh crunch. I do like the Pittsburgh crunch. It is a good move. So we, we we would see much more from from Douglas in terms of like personality uh as it would go on in, in the company uh so like you know as a first match I guess we've got that out of the way now on the show um after the match oh yeah sorry I I do want to mention that during the phase where him and Duncan were not on the same page to get Duncan to take a bump uh Shane Douglas had to hit, I think, the only time in recorded history, a shoot Luthez press yes, on him. Yes, what the fuck? Um, that was very funny. Uh, the Rednecks attack at the bell. Uh, Saturn comes out, but the numbers are too many. He gets flattened by the cowbell, and then they hog tie him. Benoit, just at catering. He's probably had uh, David Flair in the crossface again. Yeah. Uh, or it's one of those things where they're afraid of fucking up their own continuity and remembering whether he should or shouldn't have the US title on them mm-hmm. at this time, so they just didn't have him come out. Um, we get a DDP promo about Nash versus Hogan. While wearing a Goldberg shirt. And sometimes I like when there's a huge match in the company and you get everybody talking about, oh, who do you think it's going to be? And they do like loads of segments throughout the night. I think that's kind of cool. It makes something appear like it's it's larger than life that even other it's, people it's on the roster It's a talking point it. backstage. But Paige is the only yes. one who does it. <laughs> makes him look like a yes, goof. It does. Um and speak is- and you know he kn- you know he knows it makes him look like a goof because he really tries hard to remind you that he's a two-time world champion. And I was just going to say and speaking of goofs we get to the next video package. 
Berlin is coming. Yep. I can't wait. I really can't wait because he gets... Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. If you've never seen Berlin, just wait for it. Just wait for it. And we also know that that means we inch ever closer to the greatest Nitro moment of all time mm -hmm. in Panama City next year. Anyway, um, we then get a Hogan versus Nash narrated this video. This is the second very good video package that you mentioned earlier on. I thought this was probably definitely one of the best video packages I've ever seen in the history of this uh, show for, from WCW. Yeah. It takes us all the way from Hogan signing to this month. And yes, they leave out key points. And yes, they, they shape the narrative to suit the story they want to tell. But that but that's, that's what, what you should, should do. do. Exactly. It's a work. You know. Um, so I thought it was very good. It was maybe like four TV audiences in the 90s. It was maybe a little long. But I was into it. It got me more into this match mm -hmm. than I, I have been at any stage. So big kudos for that. Uh, then we get a replay of most of Savage's promo on Rodman from Monday. Leading us inexplicably to our in-building main event. Not the main event of the show. Because as I said, the main event of the show is a six-man tag from Nitro. The main event in the building is Evan Courageous versus Randy Savage. What the fuck is this? Evan Courageous gets to cut a promo, Dave. This whole segment is all fucking over the place, Lee. This is abysmal. Yeah. abysmal. I, I've been in on Macho since he returned. The, I'm out here. This is fucking bad. Yeah, I think we said the last time he wrestled that we were out on him in the ring. He's, but he, he was still, had still like... But I think from the the promo last week... I think since... Then the promo Monday and I now think this. since that in-ring segment with Rodman and the fucking the fake agent... Mm -hmm. Ever since then, everything he's done has just been... Put put some respect on Arliss's Whatever name. Whatever his fucking name is. Yeah, I think it's all been... I think it's been steadily downhill since then for the man. But uh, this particular week has accelerated it for me. Um. So, uh, immediately describes this match as just a tune-up. Um... He teases the crowd, asks them, do they want to know who the Hummer yes. driver and Gorgeous George's yes. bodyguard is? Uh, and then he just doesn't do it. He says, don't worry, because I'm the world's greatest problem solver. Uh, Evan decides to stand up for women, and because this is 1999, he gets booed for it. <laughs> Great I stuff, will say, he WCW. describes Mona as like a sister to him. And Larry yes. straight away goes, well, he obviously has a, a crush on Mona. <laughs> Yeah, which tells you it's more revealing of Larry's yeah. character than anything else. Uh, he expresses disappointment in Macho for the way he's been treating Mona and others. Uh, in spite of that, Savage asks him who's going to win at the pay-per-view, and he says Macho's going to beat Rodman. This is just padding his uh, fucking ego at this point. Yeah, he gives props to Evan, then offers his hand, boots him in the gut, and a match finally breaks out. Uh, Macho throws him outside the ring Mona comes out early on to cheer her De facto brother on I guess uh, Courageous has been getting his ass kicked For like a minute and a half straight But then scores a drop kick that knocks Savage down A few punches and then he goes down again Outside the ring I should point out that this match goes over two minutes And he takes several bumps And still Randy Savage does not remove his sunglasses uh, No 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 you, you have neglected to mention That Randy is wrestling in leather pants Yes. A sparkly shirt that is at least two sizes too small for him. Yeah, it's the sparkly shirt. If you've been watching the shows along, it's the one he's been wearing lately. The, the sunglasses and the leather Kangol hat. Yes, which he also doesn't lose. Yes. Very much the fucking, like, macho man super callow here, <laughs> like, is what he's doing. <laughs> um, but yeah, he, he works his whole match without ever losing any item of clothing. A bit that I think would have been a good spot, but they mistimed it out of an abundance of caution, is that he goes outside the ring and attempts to use Mona as a shield, and Courageous planches over Mona and hits Randy. But Mona mo was moved out of the way so early that it looked preposterous. Yeah. But it was a good idea, mm -hmm. um, at least. Uh, I will say that on the bump for the plancha, Evan Courageous nearly dies. Uh Savage does not catch him properly and he scorpions himself on the floor. Yeah. 
the sunglasses finally come off, but Savage has control again. Scoop slam, elbow, picks him up at two, takes off his belt, whips him. It's the, maybe the only time in history I've ever seen someone do the take off the belt and whip someone exactly one time. He, he too much too much effort to put into whipping the second time. Yeah. Uh, he goes up for the elbow again. Mona comes in, and this is a much better time yeah. spot where she comes in and she's standing over Evan pleading, and he just drops the elbow, and she has to move out of the way at the last second. Uh, then Savage goes for her. She falls over. Larry implies that she must have twisted her ankle, trying to run away from him. Again, because of the send for the man, this has real bad vibes. Mm-hmm. Um so she falls over Johnny Boone of all people the referee jumps on Savage's back to come to Mona's uh, aid uh, but he eats a pile driver for his trouble and gets thrown out of the ring a third diving elbow asks for the mic counts his own pin and says no one in this crowd has a doubt what's going to happen to Rodman and that is it for in ring thunder for this week fucking hell definitely like the worst in ring thunder we've ever had in one hour and 16 minutes, there were two segments totaling maybe four and a half minutes that did anything in terms of build positively for Road Wild. And those were both video mm-hmm. packages. The Harlem Heat one, which does great on the telling you everything about Harlem Heat, but in hindsight and reflection, does not mention one time that they have a match or who their opponents yes, are. Yes, never once mentioned to try it. Yes. Uh, and then, yes, the Hogan-Nash video package, which, again, they're really putting a lot of eggs in the basket on that one, so I, I get them making that a big deal with the big, long video mm-hmm. package, so I don't begrudge them of that, and God damn, it was a million times more entertaining than anything that actually happened in the ring on this show. Before we go to our usual go-home pay-per-view game, I will let you all know that the finish counter brought to you by Ludwig Borga, has four matches with three clean finishes and one non-finish. Would you like to give us, uh, I've done this the wrong way around now, but fuck it, uh, your winners and losers for this thunder, apart from us? Sid. Sid's the winner. He Mm -hmm. beat two men at once. You know, he's the winner. Also, he's Sid. Yeah. Um, Losers. uh, I'm out of Macho. I I just... I'm I'm done with him. I'd contend DDP is in oh, there Oh, yeah, as because well. of the, the goofy fucking... Here's my opinions on the fucking main event that I'm not involved in. Yeah. He's one of those guys that if there was a run in this, he in, and it was in WWF, he'd be coming out. Instead of wearing his own T-shirt, he'd be wearing the pay-per-view yeah. T-shirt. Um, yeah, that's fair. Um, right. So... If this is your first pay-per-view cycle with us at Days of Thunder, firstly, we're happy to have you. Secondly, a game that we play every pay-per-view cycle to see how well WCW have been building their pay-per-view is to try and stump Lee Malone. Ask him to name all the matches that are going to be on the pay-per-view having just watched the TV. Now, this month, you have a little bit of a benefit, Lee. We have watched two Nitros from this pay-per-view cycle as well as all the Thunders. So, in terms of quantity of time you're a little bit more armed than you normally would be. Will that play into your favor in this? Time will tell. Um, but what I will tell you is that there are nine matches Oof, on this show. Okay. So, best of luck, buddy. Name those matches. Um, before I name the matches, I will say we have to select the match. Well, I have to select the match after we run down the card to crown our newest martial arts division champion. For the pay okay. Do you want to do now? There are two ways we can do this. There's the way you're thinking of doing I'm... this, where we name the yeah. matches, but then there's secret option B, which is the agent of chaos option, which is I give you the numbers one to nine, and you pick a number, Ooh. and whoever gets the pinfall in that match is the martial arts division champion. Now, you are the commissioner of continuity like here I at like the podcast. Option. Okay. But anyway, so, we'll, we'll come matches. back to that. Once I name the matches, we'll, we'll do that. Okay. Okay. Right. Nine matches. Okay. We will start at the top. Hulk Hogan versus Kevin Nash. Number one. Yes. Macho Man Randy Savage versus Dennis Rodman. Yes. Chris Benoit versus DDP. That is three. Chris Canyon and Bam Bam Bigelow versus 
Harlem Heat. Um, yes. <laughs> For a second there, I was like, oh my <laughs> God. Say, what the Did fuck they forget to do the match? Um, yeah, four. Sid, Sid versus <laughs> Sting. Five. Goldberg versus Rick Steiner. Six. Buff Bagwell versus The Cat. Seven. The West Texas Rednecks versus the Filthy Animals. No. They literally said it on Thunder. There's a six man on the show. There is. Oh, sorry. West Texas Rednecks versus uh, the Revolution. Not the. the yes. Yes. Uh, so that's what? Seven? Eight? Eight. So is there a Filthy Animals match against the Deadpool? Yes. So is that a six man or an eight man? Six, six man. man. Okay. All right, so I named I named them all. So, yes, well done. By the way, doesn't always happen. Doesn't always happen. I think this is maybe the second or third time ever. Right. So now I get to do the the one to nine gimmick. Yeah. Now you don't have to. Again, I'm just saying this. I know a uh, friend of the show, Thunderbully Kim Guys, is probably it's taken years off his life. This one. Well, look, they, um, Kim did the the lineal champion from whatever point that was. So there's there's no argument with with the work they've done. Yeah, yeah. But they also included house shows, so if we're just going by whatever we see, so that's all that matters to us. Yeah, yeah. That we we can we thank you for your work. They, they did a phenomenal yes. job on, on this, but I think it's very. I suppose it leans into the WCW gimmick that. As continuity Malone, you actually have little to no regard for I continuity don't care, yeah. or no. fairness. You are capricious exactly. of something else. Um, right, so let's go with match number. Let's go match number five. Okay, so the new martial arts division champion will be the winner. Of Chris Benoit versus DDP. Ooh, okay. Uh, either side of that, you could have had, if you'd said four, you would have had Bagwell versus the cat. <sighs> and six would have given you Sting versus Sid. Interesting. Okay, so why the, the fuck, uh, why the the fuck winner... is Bagwell versus the cat match number? Oh, God. Anyway, yeah. anyway. Well, I will tell you if this helps in terms of uh, looking forward to this pay-per-view. No match goes longer than 13 minutes. Really doesn't help me. There's some (laughs) bad matches on this show. And it's Sturgis. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I will say one thing I am looking forward to, though, for Sturgis, is watching the bikers react to American-made Hulk Hogan. Yeah, yeah. It should be a, it should be an interesting show, and we've got. I don't know if it's straight in the Observer afterwards, but there's some very interesting stories I alluded to of the journey the wrestlers take to Sturgis. Isn't, isn't this the one eventually. where somebody nearly dies? Uh, yeah, both Rick Steiner and Goldberg were missing, presumed dead at yes. a certain point during the bike rally. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that that's a story for another uh, day. Yes, thank you all for listening to another edition of Days of Thunder. Um, this we hope you've enjoyed this pay-per-view cycle like no other though we're really chomping at the bit for for road wild uh we'll be back in a week behind the paywall with at the movies talking they live starring roddy piper um directed by john carpenter and in two weeks we will return here on the voices of wrestling podcast network with our review of road wild 1999 until then be well stay safe we shall see you all very soon Thanks everyone for listening to another episode of Days of Thunder. Days of Thunder was produced by Lee Malone and edited by me, Dave Ryan. To keep up to date with the show and find all the ways to listen to us, you can follow us on Twitter at WCW Thunderpod or click the Linktree link in our Twitter bio or in the show notes. I am at the Day to Dave on Twitter and Lee is at Malone underscore 713. Days of Thunder is a part of the Voices of Wrestling podcast network. Follow the VOW network anywhere good podcasts are sold for more fine podcasts than you can shake a stick at. Thanks. Can you hear the thunder?
Hello, do you like New Japan Pro Wrestling? Are you a Shin Nihon freak? If so, check out the Super Jcast with Joel and Damon on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. And even if you fucking hate New Japan Pro Wrestling, listen to the Super Jcast anyway. Not just for our great show reviews, analysis, and pastrami sandwiches, mm-hmm. but there's also usually some dick jokes somewhere in the obligatory opening 30 minutes of absolute nonsense we chat about every single week. That's the Super Jcast for all the best talk about New Japan Pro Wrestling, crisps, and pornography. Hello there, my name's Neil David and I'm the host of Euro Graps Express, the podcast exclusively dedicated to the wrestling of Europe. If it's wrestling and it happens in Europe and it's good, we talk about it. Whether it's Rev Pro, Progress, WXW, Passion Pro, Pro Wrestling Chaos, Pro Wrestling North, we don't care, we talk about them all. If it's good and it's exciting, I want to share it with you. We're on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Check us out on the feed. Check us out on Twitter at Eurograps EXP. And join us for chat about European wrestling and a little bit of chat about cheese. Hopefully see you there.